uh, really, really nice to see everyone here in person. I love seeing people face to face and in person. It is the best. So, in this paper, um, I'd like to explore some of the themes which have emerged uh, throughout the course of my research on skateboarding and urban space. Uh, I'll be discussing placemaking, spatial politics, and new materialism, among other things. I'll begin with an introduction to my research, then provide a brief outline of the burgeoning field of skateboard studies, before returning to my own research and the specific context of East London to, present, uh, to suggest some potential avenues for exploration in practice research on sustainable community building. The questions which I'm currently concerned with are, can we use skateboarding to build inclusive community spaces? How can we work to ensure that urban regeneration projects are truly inclusive of everyone and don't exclude the local community through processes of gentrification? And what can applying a critical lens, or perhaps I should say lending a critical ear to skateboarding in this particular historical moment, teach us about how to imagine and produce the kind of world that we would like to live in? So one question that I probably ought to consider first, though, is this. What exactly do I mean by this particular historical moment? What does that look and what does that sound like? Maybe it's just me, but I feel like skateboarding has been cropping up on everybody's radar a little bit more often recently. Uh, my personal litmus test for this is that every time I visit my granddad, he seems to have a new opinion on skateboard culture. Uh, you might have noticed it uh, appearing more frequently in advertising. You might have watched Sky Brown represent the UK in the Tokyo Olympics. Or maybe you've read a piece in a local newspaper about a fundraiser for a new community skate space. You might have even, like many others, in a state of lockdown-induced delirium, decided it was time to learn to skateboard, which is exactly what I did. So I'd learned to, uh, uh, I'd grown up with skateboarding as a teenager, um, but I spent a lot more time hanging around at skate parks than actually skating. Uh, so in April 2020, I found myself at a DIY skate spot in Aarhus, Denmark, which is where I was living at the time, landing my first kickflip in about 10 years. This DIY spot holds a special place in my heart. Smedex is located in a container village built on an old railway yard which hosts a semi-autonomous community of artists and architects. The thriving community of skateboard skateboarders in Aarhus have managed to create a highly democratic, non-hierarchical, inclusive skate space, mostly out of old junk and donated materials. It might not be the greenest space, but I would argue it's sustainable insofar as it's built and maintained by the local community, who have a deep sense of con connection with the material environment there, even though it's made of concrete. At the center of this scene, are a crew called Skatey Kate, who host weekly sessions for underrepresented skaters uh, who are pr primarily women and girls and queer and non-binary folk. Uh, so one thing that I couldn't help but notice while spending time relearning to skate at Smedex was how the experience compared to my time spent at skate spaces in the mid-2000s in the northeast of England, which is where I'm from. Um, I was impressed that the skaters at Smedex had managed to create a space not only of creative, expressive playfulness, but also of care, of intergenerational learning, of openness and acceptance. Perhaps the seeds of these things were always there in skateboarding, but they were harder to make out against the backdrop of hyper-masculine performativity, which characterized skateboard culture in the 2000s. The skaters at Smedex had built a community in the truest sense of the word. So I became interested in the interplay of environment, materials, and people, which made this kind of space possible. So this interest brought me to my current research on skateboarding and urban space in East London. As part of this research, I've been involved with City Mill Skates, which is a project proposing to build skatable architecture on the new UCL East Olympic Park later this summer, uh, the new UCL East Campus, sorry, later this summer. Um, and that will be based on consultations with local user groups. City Mill is unique in that it's one of the first experiments in creating a skate-friendly public space in the UK, as opposed to the conventional skate park, which is purely designed for skateboarding and often draws a clear line between skateboarder and civilian. 
my PhD supervisor, Esther Sayers, is part of the City Mill Skate team. So I've been lucky enough to follow the process so far, attending design meetings, community consultations, and site visits. I'm particularly interested in City Mill Skate because I think it lies at the intersection of lots of different movements in skateboarding um, at the moment. And the context of the Olympic Park only serves to magnify this. The space is intended to reflect the type of community space that I was lucky enough to experience in Denmark. Free to use, open to all, playful and creative. However, making this a reality in the UK requires lots of collaborations which are fairly new to skateboarding, which historically has relied on DIY placemaking practices. For example, City Mill has had to endure endless hoop jumping in order to appease the London Legacy Development Corporation, who currently manage the Olympic Park, as well as collaborating with construction companies in order to source leftover materials from the campus build, which will be incorporated into the space. Alongside this, it's important to note that all of this is taking place in Stratford, a deprived area which is undergoing rapid gentrification, owing in no small part to the development of the Olympic Park since the 2012 Games. All of this puts me in mind of the Long Live South Bank campaign to save the Undercroft, which is the UK's first found skate space. Ultimately, I think the campaign was a resounding success and a testament to the importance of free-to-use creative community spaces in, city, in an increasingly privatised city centre. However, I think it's important to note that one factor in uh, the success of this campaign was the support of Boris Johnson, then Mayor of London. This presumably did wonders for his public image, and for me it begs the question, how punk can something really be if Boris Johnson is into it? So that, I guess, is what I mean by this particular historical moment. Skateboarding seems to occupy this strange space between emancipatory and anti-capitalist on the one hand, and hyper-neoliberal and individualistic on the other. Can anything withstand this amount of growth and co-option in a capitalist system while staying true to its DIY countercultural roots. Let's uh, step back for a second and take a look at what got us here. So a very abridged history of skateboarding goes something like this. Skateboarding gained popularity in the 1960s as a downtime activity for surfers on the coastline of California. Surfers would imitate the movements they performed in the ocean, reimagining the hard ground as an endless concrete wave. Droughts in the 70s led skaters to discover the endless possibilities of backyard swimming pools, transforming middle-class suburbia into a sprawling plain of opportunities for trespassing, adventure, risk-taking, and limit-pushing. A surge in popularity led to a skate park boom in which spaces were built to emulate the vertical walls of these pools, many of which were then closed in the 80s in the States over concerns about injury lawsuits. This meant that skateboarding in the late 80s and early 90s moved into the streets. Thanks to the pioneering work of early freestyle skaters such as Rodney Mullen in developing a vocabulary of tricks which allowed skaters to jump or ollie up ledges, onto rails and down stair sets, as well as flipping in and out of tricks, modern street skating was born, and the urban environment now presented a space of infinite possibilities for play and self-expression. It's important to note that this, like any narrative and like any history, is contested. In a brilliant book called Skateboarding and Femininity, Danny Abelhauer shows how women and girls' experiences in skateboarding have typically been neglected by core skateboarding and received less media coverage. Abelhauer revisits episodes in skateboarding history to demonstrate that women and girls have been taking and holding space in skateboarding in various ways since the 1960s. There are two other researchers that I think are worth mentioning here. They're often cited as the classics in a relatively young emerging discipline of skateboard studies. Architectural historian Ian Borden argues that skateboarders have a unique ability to radically reimagine the urban environment. Using the work of French Marxist philosopher Henri Le Henri Lefebvre, uh, Borden contends that skateboarders actively transform the city through a formative reappropriation of urban architecture. Skateboarders see the city through the skater's eye, 
which eschews the prescriptive exchange value of the capitalist urban environment in favor of its use value, its boundless creative potential. Skateboarding, then, is a performative critique of the city as a space of neoliberal production, a critique of the idea that we should be working all the time rather than playing. Becky Beale's work, on the other hand, has a sharper focus on identity and social justice in skateboarding. Beale suggests that skateboarding provides a space for participants, at the time primarily young white men, to develop alternative masculinities which encourage self-expression and open participation. However, Beale also notes the incongruent sexist behaviour found in the subculture, which, she argues, reproduce dominant masculine heteronormative social hierarchies. Based on my own experiences from seeing it on the inside as a young white man growing up in the 2000s, I think it would be more than fair to say that skateboard culture at that time was not the most welcoming place for marginalized people. So, where are we now? A combination of factors probably most notably the introduction of skateboarding into the Olympic Games, and also the accessibility of skateboarding over lockdown, um, have led to a huge boom in skateboarding. This, I would argue, has led to the simultaneous sportification and diversification of skateboarding. So in short, this means that <clears throat> as skateboarding grows, we're seeing more and more instances of the type of co-option that I mentioned in relation to Boris earlier. We've even seen the coining of the term skatewashing to, to describe this type of phenomenon, although I think maybe no amount of skatewashing could save Boris at this point. Mm -hmm. Alongside this, we've also seen a massive increase in participation from women and girls, people of color, and LGBTQIA plus folk. I think that this increase in participation has some really exciting potential and shows that now, more than ever before, the skate scene is in need of active allyship and community spaces which promote this. To quote a recent edit called Ruining Skateboarding, which showcases a whole host of marginalized skaters, the their team's eclectic mix of underrepresented skateboarders is actually the most punk rock thing that the industry has seen in years. So, let's shift our focus now to the material environment of the Olympic Park. The park was designed and built to host the 2012 Olympic Games, and at this time, as we know, skateboarding was not considered an Olympic sport. Interestingly, this means that the park is full of instances of this stuff, hostile architecture. Um, so this ranges from skate stoppers, like you see here on the side of the bench, to anti-homeless spikes, to the especially infamous Camden bench, which is that one right there. Uh, the Camden bench was presumably designed by somebody who was so paranoid about human agency as to render the bench almost entirely unusable. Um, all this over-management serves to create an atmosphere of what Mark Fisher might describe as a boring dystopia. The oppression isn't in your face, but it's subtly guiding you to the nearest coffee shop so that you can continue being a good model consumer. Seen through a new materialist lens, we could argue that hostile architecture serves to teach you about who is allowed in the space and what they're allowed to do there. This, in turn, can teach us about the power structures which underlie these design choices. Would it not be possible to flip this way of thinking on its head, to build a space which teaches that everyone is welcome and invites open engagement and creative experimentation? This, of course, is what City Mill intends to do, and I'm very curious to see how it plays out throughout the course of my research. It was around the time that I was beginning to photographically archive instances of defensive architecture on the Olympic Park that I encountered the concept of acoustomology. This led me to wonder if the material environment can teach us visually about the underlying structures which govern our interactions with space, what might a sonic engagement teach us? Acoustomology is a term coined by the anthropologist Stephen Feld following his fieldwork with people living in the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Acoustomology conjoins acoustics and epistemology to describe the relational ontology which emerges from knowing with and through the audible. 
as well as describing the type of world for you that arises through a deep relationship with the sonic environment, acoustomology as a mode of thinking inquires into what becomes knowable through sounding and through listening. Acoustomology does not evoke epistemology in the formal sense of metaph metaphysical investigations into truth. Rather, it engages the relationality of knowledge production. Sound, I think, is particularly interesting in relation to spatial politics insofar as it is invisible. What might happen when we shift the focus from seeing and being seen to listening and being heard? Could sonic thinking about materiality, like the earlier visual analysis of hostile architecture, teach us something about the power structures which underlie the management of the Olympic Park, and perhaps even the invisible power structures which operate within skateboarding itself. Sound is interesting here in another regard. I think sound is integral to a skateboarder's sense of their own position in space. For example, the sound of metal trucks on coping, or lack of it, can teach a skater how to adjust their weight or speed on the, next, on the following attempt. The mechanism inside the ear is also intimately connected to one sense of balance and proprioception. So in this sense, sonic thinking, one could argue, unveils a world which is ever alive and in flux. Rather than revealing discrete objects of perception, sound reveals a world of temporal events, of subjects, and of interactions. The sonic environment, much like the one described by new materialism, is relational to its core. Could this provide us for a new model for thinking about public space in cities, one which recognizes and encourages agency rather than attempting to stifle and contain it. In order to open up my own mode of sonic practice in skateboarding, I've started to make binaural recordings of skate spaces. So, binaural recordings produce three-dimensional audio, <clears throat> which allow the listener to inhabit the perspective of the recorder, hearing the roar of wheels on concrete as other skaters pass by, the harsh scrape of metal trucks on granite, the rhythmic click clacking of paving stones echoing off the ceiling. You can also sometimes make out other members of the public in these recordings, revealing information about how the space is situated in relation to other users. It's early days in my sonic exploration of skateboarding right now, but ultimately, what I want to suggest here is that sonic thinking about skateboarding in public space is relevant to broader questions around sustainability, social justice, and urban environments. The activities that we feel able to do in public space and the people who feel able to participate in them could reveal a lot about the power structures which govern it. If we want to gain more agency over the urban environment in which we live, we may need to foster a deeper connection with it. My suggestion is that sonic thinking may be, may be able to offer us the tools to connect with this world, to better understand the structures which organize it, and finally, perhaps, to challenge these structures and allow us to imagine the new realities that we want to build in their place. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can we listen to some? Yeah, sure. That's that's this. Do we have time to listen to some? You do. Is that all right? Twelve minutes. Cool. <laughs> this is one minute, and I can't remember which one it is. There's one which gives you a little bit more to hang on to, and there's one which gives you not a lot to hang on to, so we'll see, if, yeah, yeah. see how it goes. I'm going to hope it plays. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
<laughs> Does anyone want to guess what they were hearing or what they were seeing or what was happening? Yeah. Can I hear your heartbeat? Yeah. Oh, interesting question. I don't think so. I feel like that's the first thing we started to hear is like a rhythmic backing and then it, maybe it was just all in my head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had that experience too. Yeah. Yeah, there's those kind of like deep bassy sounds coming mm -hmm. through in the beginning, yeah, right? Be yeah, yeah, yeah. You can hear a mum trying to help her daughter, I think, on a skateboard, and then uh, it's just screaming. <laughs> so yes. you think she fell. Yeah, yeah, so this, this is actually recorded at um, Hackney Bumps, which is <laughs> situated right next to um, a Children's Park. Oh. So what you hear there is, I think I'm skating past and I try a trick on a ledge next to the park and I fall off and then just as I fall off a kid falls off something in the play park <laughs> and screams so it's like that little combination yeah, going on there I think it just happened like maybe just after you fell because there was a bit of silence and then that broke through straight away yeah. so it was interesting yeah. yeah, that was why I went for that one there was, oh. there's another one with like because people play music in these skate spaces a lot as well mm -hmm. so sometimes you're skating around and then you kind of We'll go past, I don't know, sometimes even four different speakers in different places so you get different music coming through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So that's actually the photo, I put the phone in my pocket to record. So the visuals that you see there are kind of like the soft material of the inside of my pocket as I'm skating around. And I kind of like it because then you hear quite hard sounds as it's happening. So you get kind of like the kind of meshy softness visually and then kind of the hard wheels on concrete. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was, um, how do you spell it for bi binaural, did you say? Binaural, B-I-N-A-U-R-A-L. Yeah, it's okay. Binaural, yeah. Binaural. And if you listen, so, so you didn't get the full effect there, if you listen with headphones, then what you get is the <coughs> effect of the sound kind of like panning around your head, so you'll feel things kind of passing by. Um, yeah, yes? I mean, for me, the, the sounds are incredibly soft, touch, it's not hard sounds, checked and there is ASMR skate videos as well mm -hmm. so it will be like somebody assembling a skateboard and you can just hear the kind of rattle of screws and that kind of thing so yeah 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 is this the kind of idea that you're um, thinking of with your the design of um, these like soundscapes I guess skateboarding um, in the architecture and how it sounds and making it less harsh I guess maybe and would that be like an, yeah. a selling point to like maybe locals and stuff? Because I know that some people like hate skate parks because it's like quite harsh sounding. But if it's architecturally designed in that, uh, what do you call it, uh, acoustomology yeah. like way, then it would be, I guess, inviting for people to have it there instead of as a... Yeah, definitely. I think that's, <laughs> that's a really good idea. And I think that is a lot of the aim with uh, what the Evil Skate wants to create is space which is welcoming for the community and it doesn't have that skate park feel, the traditional skate park feel where you look at it and you're like that's the space for someone who already knows how to do that and, and mm -hmm. operates already within that space. Thinking about how to do that sonically is yeah an, another thing entirely I guess. Yeah. Um, one of the really cool things which has come through in some of the consultations, um, the City Mill Skate consultations which I've sat in on has been um, thinking about ways that we can offer sonic cues to uh, adaptive skaters. Mm -hmm. So for example, like visually impaired skateboarders use sonic cues in order to navigate the environment. So there might be kind of like ridges on the ground which uh, dictate like how close you are to an ob object. Um, and they also use these cool kind of like beeping boxes which you can place um, mm -hmm. around. Um, yeah, but I like that idea of like soft concrete or like a soft skate space. Yeah. So I was thinking about like I like skate skateboarding, but like longboarding, like yeah. calm stuff. But when I go to a skate park, I find like I've ADHD and I'm very sensory. Like can't 
cope with a lot of that. And so I'm thinking if like kids of who are autistic or have um, other sensory overwhelm, mm -hmm. if it was <coughs> done in a way that was less harsher, then maybe they would be more, I don't know, yeah. Yeah. participate. Mm -hmm. I think the way, the one way you can think about that is think about the lines that are going to end up happening. So like the directions that people are going to end up skating in. Um, so like Mile End is right next to where I live, and I feel like Mile End kind of encourages this circle, like the material environment of Mile End encourages this kind of circle of death style skating, where it's like all the really good skaters just loop and loop and loop. So I think it's a lot about thinking about okay, where are people going to start? What kind of obstacles are they going to want to engage with? And what kind of ability level? Anyone else? Very briefly, I, I was just thinking about the relationships between the different senses as you were talking, and not just the visual and the sound, but maybe you know, opening it sort of more broadly to sort of multiple senses and how they interrelate. The sort of relationship, the comorbid morbidity and the relationships between our different senses and, and how we understand as a consequence uh, of those relationships and how they interconnect. So I was really intrigued by that idea of a hostile mm -hmm. architecture. And how perhaps the hostility comes at us in you know, multiple ways, not just in terms of the sound, not just in terms of the, of the visual. So I was just thinking about how they sort of possibly extend beyond just perhaps these. I know there's a really interesting philosopher who's done some work with neuroscientists looking at these relationships, these sort of ways that they coexist to create understanding. So that and he's an expert in um, wine, yeah. and taste and smell, and how we know, how we understand through sort of those kinds of aspects. So applying that to a space, I think that's really also quite interesting. How we also perhaps have that sort of understanding of spaces uh, through multiple senses rather than yeah. isolating the senses. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's been something I've been grappling with with the sonic thinking. It's like does it just shift? Because in some ways it's a critique of ocular centrism, but then does it just uh, morph into somnocentrism? So trying to find ways of moving between the senses. And also, yeah, when you mentioned hostile architecture and sound, so there's a history of that because, I don't know if you remember those like mo mosquito devices, I think they were called, so like only young people could hear this. Yeah, sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. tinnitus sound. I think, I think thankfully they've been banned. Yeah. They're still available for cats. <laughs> yeah. And it's also an interesting thing about the people who are flogging these defensive um, architectural kind of devices. There's a really weird, I should, put, I should have put that in this slide, there's a really weird website that looks like it's from, I don't know, the very early days of the internet where it's like someone selling skate stoppers and it's all kind of HTML style weirdness. And I would imagine the mosquito sound industry is quite a weird one. <laughs> Just three minutes. Minutes away. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah. I was just really interested about as you've been talking through that, especially with the, the idea of sound and um, the idea of sound as something that's quite rebellious. And it made me think about um, there's a library in Manchester, from Manchester, and it's, it's, it's in the round. And when you go, it's obviously a very quiet space. Um, and there's something really um, exciting about shutting the As you were talking about the idea of molecularism, but also inclusivity, and then making these spaces uh, accessible and inclusive, I wondered if there is, do you think that there's any, um, there's a lack of the rebelliousness within the skateboarding, like the agency within that, because it is such a rebellious thing to do, like those sounds, although they were really soft in that, they really also cut through a lot of that neoliberal space. Um, if you've got somebody whizzing past you or the disruption of those spaces. Um, and I wonder within like um, the development of those spaces that you're talking about, is there, is there something about the rebellious nature and the resistance against those new, the neoliberal spaces? Is, is that lost or is that...? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think that that's necessarily like lost, but I think that... Let me think about that. 
So yeah, so, so the disruptive element is kind of a lot of what Ian Borden talks about, this, this um, act of kind of rebellion against, um, like street skating specifically, so using found objects in the street to skate on, um, as critiquing kind of like their design and what they're designed to encourage you to do. Um, I think that skate-friendly spaces are kind of like one potential evolution in skateboarding which has come about from this this recent growth in skateboarding, which I would hope offer the potential to hang on to some of the disruption that we've seen in um, kind of the performative reappropriation in, in uh, street skateboarding, whilst offering a safe space for a lot of people who are newer to the skate community to operate with, within as well. Um, and I think those two things can happen at once. <laughs> okay.